Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube. What do we do here on Getting Sketchy? Well, either myself or my good friend and fellow artist and artist teacher, Ashley Hurst, tries to create a drawing for you inside of 45 minutes. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. Uh, tonight is episode two of this season, which is season eight. And this season, we are dealing with the wheel. And uh, if you missed last week, what, what we essentially do is we have two wheels. One wheel we roll. I think I have maybe some video here. Let's see here. Yeah, there we this are. is from a couple weeks ago. Um, we roll one wheel for the medium and one wheel for the subject matter. And uh, this was a couple of weeks ago. So this is what I did last week. But um, last week, I, I gave the wheels a spin for Ashley and it came up on graphite and landscape. So he's going to be doing a pencil drawing, but he's also going to be using some graphite too. Just some free flowing graphite, which you'll see in just a right, all kinds of graphite tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, on white drawing paper and he's going to be doing a landscape. He's sitting over there in the driver's seat so how are you doing over there tonight? i'm doing great matt thanks for asking i'm anxious to talk about my paper and my materials and our subject and a uh, few elements and principles of art that are pretty um, clear and obvious in that subject so uh, we'll switch over in just a moment and take a look at that Absolutely. And I'd like to remind you, if you are watching this live on YouTube, it is a live show. So uh, there is a chat box. You can post questions and um, make comments, of course. And if you do have a comment or question that's directed at myself or Ashley, if you put in all capital letters, that'll help me see it a little bit easier since I'm going to be running the chat box tonight. Of course, you can ask us anything that's art related. It doesn't have to be what we're talking about tonight or what we're doing tonight, uh, which we'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but before we do, I want to remind you, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel and click on the notification bell so you're notified when we do go live with these Getting Sketchy broadcasts and also when we just publish uh, the videos that I publish all the time here on this channel. Um, also, if you like this video, make sure you give it a like. And if you want to take your drawing and painting skills to another level, well, we've got a program for that over at thevirtualinstructor.com. Our program includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of subject matter and media, weekly live lessons, which are all recorded and stored in our vault. In fact, after we're done here with Getting Sketchy, we're going to head over to thevirtualinstructor.com. And Ashley is leading in a series right now where he's painting with gouache. So you get access to all the live lessons and weekly critiques as part of the Members Minute. There's also a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. So if you want to check that out, of course, I'll leave a link in the description below. Actually, there's a link in the description below already. And if you want to check out three of our course videos and eBooks for free, you can do that too if you wish. There is a link in the description below for that as well. And uh, you can check that out later because we're ready to get started here with getting sketchy i hear the, the the chime of the lights turning on so it looks like ashley's ready to go Are you ready to go oh there? yeah re ready to go all right well we'll switch over to uh, the main camera over here and you can see ashley's got his materials laid out i'll let him take it away matt you got some pretty sweet comments coming in about that shirt tonight so <laughs> oh, your combo orange and blue yeah i'm all about orange and blue that's right we know that orange and blue are complementary colors and uh it's also in uh, harmony with the logo of uh, the virtual instructor, of course, which is orange and blue. And with That's the weather, because you guys have been talking about the weather where you're from, and it's been hot where oh we're from. Oh my gosh, so. I am on the verge of sweating right now <laughs> because it is 76 degrees in here with the air conditioner going full blast. Um, it, I think it was 98, 99 degrees today. It Something was like that. at least mid nineties. Yeah. Um, That's hot. And where we are, the humidity is really bad. So it feels like it's like 130. I mean, you really go outside and you're, you can only be out there for a couple of minutes before you have to go back inside. So, uh, I'll definitely take this over the freezing cold, freezing rain nastiness oh, yeah. i'd yeah. much rather be sweating my butt off so anyway well, we've got a pretty we've got a pretty hot subject to work on today <laughs> um so let's go ahead and take a look at our materials there's a lot of them out and i'm going to use all that you see on the screen today that's right there's even a brush in here so let's take a look we've got a 
a 3H pencil. That's what I'll start with. It's by um, Venus. I don't even know if you make, make, make Venus pencils anymore. It's a super old pencil. And then we've got a couple of Faber-Castell uh, Faber brand pencils, a 2B and a 5B. So those are the uh, pencils I intend to use. Uh, I've got some eraser choices as well. We've got the electric eraser. Um, you can do this drawing without it. The, eraser, the electric eraser is going to make it a, a lot easier, um, but it's, it's, it's possible to do this drawing just the same without it. You would just be working with the sharper edges of maybe a uh, like a pink rubber eraser like this or even a white vinyl eraser. It's white vinyl inside of the electric eraser. I also have a kneaded eraser and a blending stump. Um, they kind of can do both of the same thing. They can help sort of unify your artwork by sort of darkening it uh, all across um, a large swath or, uh, or even lightening a large swath together. So in, in any case, we'll be using all of those. And um, for our first step, you know, you can see the reference on the left. If you squint your eyes at it, it's pretty balanced in terms of approximate symmetry. The light areas and the dark areas are in the same place from right to left. Um, and then there's some a light area in the middle, the water, and then the sky is pretty light also, a little darker at the top of the sky than the bottom. So what I thought I would do is start with the powdered graphite um, for myself, or you could just start with a pencil and your stump to sort of smooth it all out so that it has the same look as powdered graphite. And just go ahead and paint in where these darker areas are going to be, just to put a base layer down. Then I'm going to switch to the pencils and work with the pencils for quite a while, and then switch to the erasers um, as sort of the final step. So we're going to go um, either like smooth gradations with our pencil and stump or with powdered graphite if you have that, and switch to a lot of mark making with the sharp pencils, followed by even more mark making um, with the eraser. And of course, we'll use the stump all along the way just to keep these marks unified together. So anyway, that's my plan. Let me go ahead and move these out of the way so we can it, take a look at our And, and while you're doing that, just two things. First of all, don't sneeze. Barely. That's right. That's right. Because right, that powder graphite will go everywhere. Yeah. Matt's got a couple of computers in front of me. I <laughs> don't want to ruin them tonight. Well, I, I'm thinking about the powder graphite going all over <laughs> your paper. Um, oh, it's gonna go. It's gonna get all over the paper anyway. And so. the second thing is, I have put uh, this photo reference with the grid and another one without the grid. If you want to use the photo reference without the grid, over on the community tab at uh, the virtualinstructor.com uh, YouTube channel. So you are watching this stream, but that doesn't necessarily mean you are on the channel. So you have to click on. Um, my little face somewhere underneath the video and that will take you to the channel and then look for the community tab and you'll see the photo mm -hmm. reference and then you can come right back over here and pick up where you left off if you want to follow along with the photo reference of course okay now speaking of the grid <clears throat> the grid I'm sorry on the photo reference it's it's very basic it's just a plus sign so we've only broken our picture plane into four spaces the picture plane is a three by four ratio <clears throat> and the size of course you can see it um, written I've, it's been on the screen a little while for you guys who are following along so you can catch up um, we're working in a four and a half by six inch rectangle tonight so that's still the same ratio three to four um, and then of course I've got that broken up just at the halfway point so if you'd like to put these grid marks on your paper you can just by dividing your rectangle um, at three inches you know, above or below the top and at two and a quarter inches from the right or left side now you'll notice I didn't draw the grid in the middle at the bottom half in the bottom half just because that's a very light area and so I didn't really want a grid line to go through there I don't need much out of this grid anyway it's just going to help us sort of establish where the dark sort of round shape is around our pond <clears throat> all right so I guess that's it um, we are pretty much ready to begin I'm going to start with the 3h pencil and I'll be glad to start um, without the timer. Well, I'm sure you would be glad to start without the timer, but that's oh, no, not going to happen. Is. Oh, no. <laughs> Almost. So the 45-minute timer is uh, really kind of a suggestion. If it takes a little bit longer than that, we'll, we'll uh, let Ashley get by with that. be flexible. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the reason why it's a good idea to sometimes draw with a timer is because it, you know when you're going to start your practice and when you're going to finish your practice. Uh, for a lot of beginning artists, it's really hard to force yourself to sit down and 
and practice. And what we're doing here is, is practicing. And sometimes you might get started on a drawing, you work for maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and then something else comes up. Well, if you have a timer, then you know your start time, you know your end time, and you know it's a manageable amount of time. So you can put in the practice that you need to get better at drawing. And drawing is a skill that anyone can learn and develop. It just takes a bit of knowledge and then practice. So practice is incredibly important. Okay, so I've begun with some just really wiggly, nervous contour lines. I always like to start with scribbly lines because I'm nervous when I start drawing for you guys anyway. Sometimes you can't tell. But in any case, they're kind of scribbly lines. And I'm really just trying to divide um, in the positive space where all the darkness is without a lot of light showing through. So um, these little edges don't follow the tips of the darkest parts of the reflection here in the bottom left quadrant. They really follow sort of the solid blacker shape that those um, reflective tips kind of grow out of. So if you're working in the same way, just, you know, you may note that my empty space here looks a lot bigger than the one in the reference because um, it does not include some of those irises that just sort of uh, sort of hang over into the middle of our composition. <laughs> All right. This does have sort of a foreground, middle ground, background. Um, so these trees are the background. So I want to separate them from the sort of the meadow or the field that I would call the middle ground here. It's got a little, just a little uh, patch of light um, that helps us to see visually where the foreground sort of meets the background. And then we've got this shrub, just a couple of... I'm going to lose, uh, I don't want to, can't draw too much in here because we would lose a lot of it in the powdered graphite, which we're going to switch to now. All right, so pretty much it's light up here. It's it's fading from light to dark in here, and then all the rest of our shape, save this, uh, this small shape here, which we'll pull back with our eraser, is pretty dark. So we'll switch to the powdered graphite. I'm using a sable brush. All right, it's a, it's a filbert. It's pretty soft. You could use a mop brush. Now, I... I don't know if you mentioned this or not, but I want to remind people, if you do start with a H pencil like Ashley did, be careful that you don't put too much pressure on the pencil and put grooves in the paper, because then when you go with a softer graphite, those grooves will show up and uh, they'll show up as lighter lines. So just be careful with that. Now, if you don't have powdered graphite, you can always purchase it. Um, they sell it online, of course, and at pretty much any art store, even the big box stores. You can make it. You can make it, um, too, by taking a piece of sandpaper and just basically shaving or rubbing. Uh, there's a piece of sandpaper right there. Sand you take a softer pencil and, just, and go right over the top of it and collect your powdered graphite there. We'll just shave some off right on our paper. That That'll take quite a while. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you can do it if you want to, uh, but the powdered graphite is pretty inexpensive. And it's a wonderful tool to have as an artist. It saves tons of time. Yeah, we're just getting rid of the white where there's almost absolutely no white. Of course, this is uh, pretty loose, so we can clean up the edges with an eraser. That's another thing about the powder graphite. It's pretty easily erased. And you can uh, just with your pencil, you can just lay down some strokes in this inside of this dark shape that are really close together and then use your stump um, kind of a perpendicular to those strokes and get a really smooth area of value just the same. All right. Alana says, I almost wish Ashley was using pastel pencils for this. He's so good at landscapes with pastels. His marks ah. are so distinctive. But Alana, that would go against our whole wheel theme right. we've got our, going on our here. mystery motif right which i forgot to mention at the beginning at the end of tonight's broadcast ashley will be spinning both of the wheels for me oh, that's right to see what i'll be drawing next week and the anticipation is already killing me <laughs> uh, there's a couple of combinations on the on both of the wheels that would be a pretty difficult that's true that's right there, um, there's some there's an opportunity for some uh I don't want to say failure, but some struggle. Some struggle. There's opportunity some for struggle. some struggle. This could be one of them. And I'm sure I will face it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got some a lot of loose graphite here I'm going to need to get rid of. Um, but there is, an, and it's okay if we lose a little bit of this shape here at the bottom in the water. Um, this is a very dark patch. But the water itself has a really nice gradation to it that really... Uh, I believe lends itself to powdered graphite. So I'm going to start working that up a little bit from the bottom up. 
And while you do that, Amanda says, have you ever used liquid graphite? I have not. I have used water-soluble graphite, but not liquid graphite. I have used that in a pencil form. Yeah, I wonder if I wonder if that is the same. And um, Mary's art says, "Hi all. Could I use water soluble graphite?" Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but if you do use water soluble graphite, it's, it's typically a good idea to work on a heavier paper, something that's going to do a good job of absorbing some of the water. So hot press or cold press watercolor paper works really well. Of course, cold press watercolor paper is going to be a little bit more toothy, uh, but you could work on heavier paper too and just use a little bit less water when you're uh, mixing it with graphite. The, the water-soluble graphite, of course. And Hootenholler says, do you ever use graphite on light-toned paper? And I have many times, but I always combine it with a, uh, a light medium too. So uh, I like to combine graphite and white charcoal, and white charcoal really isn't charcoal at all. Um, well, there might be a little bit of charcoal in there, but it's white. Yeah. And we know that burnt organic material like charcoal is not actually white. So some kind of pigment has been added to it. But I do like that combination of media. Have you ever used graphite on light toned paper, Ashley? Yes, but I did the same thing. Yeah. I, I used actually I used um, white colored pencil and also white gouache. Yes. As my white material. Yeah. Uh, typically, when you're working on a, a toned surface, even if it's lightly toned, uh, it's a good idea to have a, a, a medium that is capable of producing light values because you can't really get a full range of value, a true full range of value, if you don't. Uh, you can only go as light as the paper will allow you to go. All right. So I went ahead and uh, we've got a nice, soft, uh, I guess, template of light and dark to start working individual marks on top of. I'm just using the kneaded eraser to clean up my edges a little bit. So it's kind of like starting almost like a, a loose painting. A, a lot like that. Kind of creating an underpainting mm -hmm. with the graphite. We're thinking right now we've, you know, we're focusing on pretty much the element of our shape, um, light and dark. So shape and value. And now we're going to switch over to texture. Um, keeping in mind that we're using texture to help create our values as well. Okay, Buddy says the idea with a wheel is a great challenge if you don't want, know what to draw or sketch next. That's very true. You could definitely have your own wheel in your house and just spin oh, yeah. that around. Yeah. Um, Derwent makes an interesting product called liquid graphite. Amanda says, try it out. And she, she yells at us, try it out! <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, okay. And Edie says, water soluble graphite. How is that possible, please? Uh, we don't really know how it's possible, but it is possible. Um, the water soluble graphite, uh, the, the water soluble graphite I have, actually, I have several forms of it. Uh, I have a few pencils, but I also have some really thick sticks. And uh, maybe I'll grab one in just a minute. I can walk there behind Ashley and he can show you what they look like. But uh, basically, you just put a little bit down, and then you activate it with a little bit of water. Uh, so you put a, make a few marks, and then you add a little bit of water. You can also wet in a brush and tip it to, uh, and touch it to the tip of the water soluble graphite, and that works too. All right, now we're going to skip around quite a bit. Um, anytime we're working with texture, sometimes our first marks seem um, a little bit strong. But hopefully, as we build hundreds of marks across our picture plane, um, these uh, first marks will feel pretty well incorporated. I don't want to get too hung up in um, where these marks are exactly in the composition, just the general density of these marks from shrub to shrub. Julie says, I'm trying something new. I brought up YouTube on my TV and then on my computer. I have a second, second delay as I was not quick enough on deleting the ads while wow, much bigger on the screen. Okay. Okay. Well, that's cool. Um, let's see. Hannah says, will graphite powder stick on any paper? It Paper that has, uh, uh, you know, at least a little bit of tooth. Tooth is, is texture. And, um, you know, the drawing paper Ashley's working on kind of has a fairly weak tooth compared to other drawing papers. But mm, there's this a, is Windsor Newton drawing paper in a drawing pad. 
Yeah. But there's enough texture there to hold on to the graphite and hold on to colored pencils and so on. But if you, there are a lot of really slick papers out there that the powdered graphite is going to be very difficult to adhere to. For example, if you applied powdered graphite to smooth Bristol paper, you can definitely do that. I've done that before, but you're going to have a lot of extra powder um, and you're going to have to really work it into the surface of the paper. So papers with a little bit more tooth or texture are going to work a little bit better with powdered graphite, but you can use it on any paper that will accept it. All right. Now the lighter marks inside of this shrub are not white. And so that's where that sort of medium gray of the powdered graphite is going to eventually um, participate. It's going to do its job. It's some very dark areas at the base of this uh, shrub that kind of breaks the horizon line that I'm working on right now. And we'll be switching to the 5B pencil for those areas. Yeah, it's already looking great up there. The drawing's looking fantastic already. Thank you. And I think when a lot of uh, folks who are new to drawing look at a subject like this. They get overwhelmed maybe by all the details. There's so much. And they think, I've got to make all these marks with my pencil. Well, we're simplifying, but in the end, without seeing the reference, you won't be able to tell that we've done so. <laughs> Jocelyn says, I'm a little late, guys, but my 16-month-old Alex gets so excited when he sees Matt and Ashley. All right. That warms my heart there, Jocelyn. Mm, me too. We have a I we wish have everyone a special got place so in excited. our heart for teenagers. <laughs> no, 16 month. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's fantastic. Anything that keeps the, the little ones happy. Cynthia says, as a mesophobe, I'm curious how messy Ashley will be at the end. He's at, uh, the workstation Ooh. over there is pretty clean. You might have a little bit of graphite yeah. on I'm gonna have some... his hand there. That's and right. of course, you can prevent that from happening with a, a paper towel or a piece of paper underneath the palm of your hand. But Ashley is rogue. I don't think you ever do that, do you? Not really. <laughs> Not really. I may have to do that some on the gouache piece just because I don't want any moisture from my hand. You know, to reactivate sort of reactivate the gouache. The gouache. Yeah at times so but uh, otherwise i typically don't do that i just try to clean it all off of myself when i'm done all right okay a lot of gonna says, work my way down that's the plan well that will continue help to alleviate around. some of that smearing and smudging right i'm kind of thinking left to right and from top to bottom just to keep my hand out of it as as much as possible alana says she has a six hour train ride from berlin to amsterdam on sunday and uh, she's hoping to start her first colored pencil piece for the year on that train ride. I hope it's a smooth train ride. Yeah. Um, I'm sure it probably is. Probably a super smooth bullet train. Okay, Martin asks, how would you describe the pressure you are using? I seem to burnish too often. Is there any advice you have for a heavy-handed drawer? Um, I'm pretty heavy-handed, too. Um, so, naturally. I've got a pretty sharp point on my pencil, and I'm I'm squeezing it pretty hard too. Um, that helps me create these uh, jagged little nervous marks. Uh, Martin, I've got a tip for you. It, it where you hold the pencil greatly affects how much pressure you can actually put on it. So That's if you true. hold the pencil, if you like hold it here, further back on the shaft, less pressure. You you can you can't physically put as much pressure on the yeah. pencil as you can when your hand's up close. So if you naturally have a heavy hand, if you just move your hand a little bit further down the shaft, then you're going to notice that you're making lighter marks. I'm going to, I'm going to start the texture in these trees with some wiggly contour lines that show their cone shape, which is a little bit unusual. It's not really a simulation of the type of texture in these trees. But then we'll go back and add some individual marks. But one of the dangers, you know, this picture had a lot of good contrast in color. But when we switch to grayscale um, and we have a lot of texture, that texture can get lost in itself. And so we have to find ways to create marks that are going to stand out from one another. And so this is one of mine, one of my ways. So you can see Ashley's basically just making a pattern that basically replicates the texture or the way we visually perceive it. So far, the shape and in the shape of these trees. And we'll just add a little variety to it so it doesn't become too static, too boring. There's this one tree. Okay, Jesse has a sweaty hand. Any advice on that? 
Well, the paper towel is a good one. What about deodorant? No, I'm just kidding about <laughs> I, that I'll one. Tell you, I'll tell you what works. <laughs> I'm going to tell you guys what works. All right. Rubbing alcohol. Okay. Okay. And it's people used to use it and they used to know it. Um, I know that uh, in the old days, I don't know, these are days before my lifetime, people would use rubbing alcohol as deodorant. So my son did a oh, science okay. experiment. Mm -hmm. My daughter, I hope my daughter's not listening. She <laughs> has sweaty feet. And of course, she's at an age where they can be, um, you know, have a strong smell. I guess. And uh, so my son did an experiment for school where he tested out different deodorants by applying them to the bottom of her feet. Oh, wow. But then to check, to test them every day, <laughs> he had to get down and smell her feet oh every gosh. day and then now, record on a scale of one to five how bad it was, right? Oh, gosh. So he, he tried all these different deodorants and finally he got to the alcohol test. Nothing. No smell at all at the end wow. of the day. Interesting. Now, I don't know oh. if it just prevents smell now, or sweating. Let me just say or this. Or if it's safe. Let me, yeah, let me <laughs> say this. Um, we are not doctors. We, are, we have no training in <laughs> the science of deodorant. Whatever you put on your body is your business, and we can take no responsibility <laughs> for any advice you may perceive to hear on this show. So if you put rubbing alcohol on your body, that's on you. Um, let's, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but it was a, it was an experiment, and he did get a good <laughs> score, a good grade for that. Well, that's good. But I, I mean, I, I took pictures. There's the photographs of him smelling his sister's feet are going to be great <laughs> to have as he gets older. Well, the visual picture in my mind is pretty good. Oh, too. it's awful. I could have yeah. never done that. Yeah, and I'm I'm even smelling salt and vinegar potato chips right now. <laughs> Um, let's see, buddy. Thank you so much for your comment there. Um, she says, if you love these videos, your head will be blown away once you see uh, the virtual instructor live sessions for members or the membership itself. Thanks so much, buddy. Uh, let's see. Guys, I, it's been a while since I have, uh, you know, called out people from wherever they are all over the world. Uh, but uh, somebody just joined in here from West Virginia. So, all right. Hello there. Um, and Pat says it probably prevents bacteria from accumulating on the skin, hence no smell. Oh, that's a good point. That's very scientifically yeah. thought out there by Pat. Now, uh, I'm just kind of going to skip around now, just finding different types of marks that I can use for the um, variety of, uh, of shrubbery. Now, going back to the sweaty hands, this this is uh, a, a bit of advice, of, of real practical advice, maybe. Um, it, the paper towel or putting a piece of paper under your hand will definitely help. Take take some breaks when you draw, too, because a lot of times you're when you're deep in that concentration, it will cause your hands to sweat a little bit. My hands sweat. In fact, my whole body sweats all the time. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> one thing that you might try doing is wearing a glove. A lot of oil Oil painters like to wear a glove, obviously because they don't want to get some of the toxic materials on their hands or they want to keep their hands clean. You can definitely wear a glove when you're creating drawings too. That's true. I've had I have students that do that. Oh, okay, sorry there, I dropped my pencil. I'm back. So now you're starting to use the eraser just as a, a little bit. tool. Yeah, just a little bit. I just wanted to find this light up here, but then we're going to go back to darker mark making, save more of the eraser till the end. And that's one of the great things about powdered graphite is it is so easy to erase. So you can go back and forth, push and pull those light and dark values. All right. I'm going to keep working around, I think, the edge of my reflection for a little while. Just finding some of the, just kind of scribbling in the darkest areas, the darkest darks that we see. Just letting the direction of the scribbles maybe mimic the direction of growth. Not getting too hung up on it, especially in areas like this, because we're going to go over this area so much with the electric eraser or eraser, and then uh, do a little smudging and then go over it some more. So it's really in this this type of area. And over here in this corner, it's really just about darkness, not so much about um, texture yet. Okay, Eric's got a great question. Which charcoal is best for practice, vine charcoal or willow charcoal? 
They're pretty much the same. Yeah. They're the same. My answer would be yes. Yes. Um, the only difference between vine charcoal and willow charcoal is vine charcoal comes from grape vines and willow charcoal comes from willow plants. So, or willow tree, I should say. So um, that's really the difference. Some some will say that the vine charcoal might be easier to erase and willow charcoal might be a little bit darker. Um, it really just you know, they're, they're so similar to each other. I kind of use them interchangeably when I, when I talk about them. Yeah. I think I say vine charcoal regardless of what I'm using. Yeah, just I think cause I do that's the, same the first, thing. first that I probably purchased a long time ago was a box of vine. It's, it uses less letters. So it saves more time in your life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get a little darker down here, just using the stump and graphite that's already there. Okay, Martin has another question. What percentage of the time does Ashley squint while drawing, if at all? A lot. Well, I will start watching his eyes. Yeah, a lot, especially see some up through stages like right now. I've been doing a lot of squinting. Now, uh, Martin brings up a good point about squinting. <clears throat> Why would you squint? It's to reduce the detail, actually, so you can take some of these um, um areas like maybe like this and just squint it down to a solid shape instead of um, a variety of shapes inside of that making multiple trees you see in the forest what the forest instead of the trees i guess it's so that we can see the forest instead of the trees the Very big good. picture yes Very the good. big picture we need to see the forest now of course of we're gonna blur some of those marks up there later on with our uh with our stump okay daily ask so we can make our own vine charcoal Yes, you could, or you could just it's so cheap. go to the store and buy it. Not a like lot of art supplies dollars. are, but that one's yeah. relatively cheap. Um, and it would be very, it would be a little bit difficult to create vine charcoal in your home or preferably outside of your home. Uh, <laughs> in a safe way. <laughs> right. I don't really know. Uh, so it's, it's, it's uh, like Ashley said, it's really, really cheap and inexpensive. Uh, Eric asked, what brand would you recommend for vine charcoal? Uh, it's really, there's, there's no brand secrets or anything <laughs> when it comes to charcoal since it's a natural material. It's the oldest media or medium known to humans, right? All the way back to the cave paintings. So hard so, to mess up. Right. If cavemen so, can make it. So you're pretty, you're pretty good on any brand that you buy. Although I have found that some, sometimes every once in a while you'll get a stick or two where it's pretty inconsistent, but you get it like is a some, hard spot in there, right? But it is from nature, so that's kind of what you would expect. Um, all of the major brands have Von Charcoal, Generals, Windsor, Windsor and Newton, and so on. Uh, so you can just go to your local art store and pick a brand that you that you've heard of if you want, or you can take a risk on a on a different brand. It's it really the charcoal is so cheap; it's it's really not that big of a deal, in my opinion. Now, I have used the 5B just to sort of lightly put in some patches of darkness over some of this uh, texture up here to make this bush feel more filled, you know, a little bit more dense without having to continue to work those uh, those individual marks in there. So I'm you've also going to start putting in some, some special marks down here in the reflection. So you've got uh, mostly middle values and light values in place. And so you're going to progressively work up to, to some super dark values. Right? Yeah, I'm getting there. We're yeah. getting there. <clears throat> Continue to get darker and then uh, and do a lot of eraser work near the end. We're at 20, about 21 minutes. So I feel like we've got a lot of material on the surface oh, now yeah, definitely. to start working. Yeah, it looks great. So um, Let's see. Hannah asks, do you ever clean the drawing stump? And if you do... How? <clears throat> I'll demonstrate. Yeah, that sandpaper there has, I think, some marks from me, actually. Me. You actually cleaned a stump? A what, stump. Did you run out of stumps? Matt uses them and throws them away. <laughs> but yeah, you can just kind of clean them off like this to get back to it. I'm getting there to get back to a clean spot. I don't want to get a lot of shredded paper on my drawing right now, <laughs> so I'm going to stop with the cleaning. But that's the idea. You just work it over there and just try to keep it tilted. You know, at the same conical angle, I don't the same angle so that you get a good <laughs> sharp point on the end, just conical. like it started. That's a good word, conical. I made uh, it up. Yeah, you don't want to use powdered paper in this drawing. We've already used powdered graphite, right? Right. Yeah, I don't <laughs> want powdered paper. That's and right. a few minutes ago, I took a stick of um, water-soluble graphite 
over there and put it next to you for the person who asked about that. Oh yeah. So whenever that's you find the, a good right, spot, there, there's the powder or the uh, water yeah. soluble graphite. And it it's works just like water soluble colored pencils, I guess. You put a little down, yeah, dry, the and then you yeah. add water to it once it's already on the surface. Now I have some pencils called graphitent pencils, which are also water soluble graphite, but they are colored. And those are interesting pencils because they're, they're not really made up of bright colors. They're all kind of earthy. They all look like they have gray mixed in with them, yeah. um, ironically. <laughs> but it is uh, you know, water-soluble colored graphite. All right, so I'm just continue to work around the light patch, okay? For, forgetting about all of these lighter iris uh, leaves, I guess they're leaves, um, that are hanging over and pointing into the, the water. Just working, continuing to work what will hopefully eventually feel like, uh, like details. Martin wonders, making, how do you resist the urge to use your fingers to blend? Um, I, you know, I guess it's uh, some experience. You know, I've used my fingers a lot to blend growing up, and I would get some dark spots in my drawing that wouldn't erase very well because of the moisture from our hand, kind of mixing in with the graphite and creating. Oh, I just did it! I just did it! I you did it! it. Kind of creating <laughs> mud. It kind of creates like a graphite <laughs> mud on your paper that is sometimes hard to um, to lighten or to lighten all the way. So after that happened a few times to me, I decided to try to keep my hands out of my artwork unless I'm using oil pastels. Yeah, yeah. for whatever reason, graphite and the oils of your hand just doesn't mix well together. They, they, they mix all right. They, well, they mix, yeah, them they separate. Just, <laughs> they just don't perform well together. Yeah, right. Uh, but, but you know, you can, you can blend with your fingers with pastels and charcoal, and it's yeah. no issue at all. But with graphite, for whatever reason, it really just almost turns into a paint and uh, stains your paper. Um, and so you've never had to like, you've never had like your finger coming slowly towards the paper and you've had to grab it with your other hand and pull it back. That's what, never happened. What was that? What's that movie <laughs> with the, it's a black and white. I think it had George C. Scott in it and um, the man that played the Pink Panther. And he kept, he couldn't control one of his arms and it constantly made a, a Nazi salute. Even oh my he, gosh. No, you know what I'm talking know about? That. Oh, it's a, it's a comedy, you know, from, yeah. I guess the fifties and it was ho horribly funny. He oh couldn't gosh. control that one arm. It was a telltale sign, I guess. Uh, no, it's not like that. There was not quite uh, like that. now they made a movie where I feel like there was a hand or an arm that was going around. It was a, like a horror movie, but it was kind of a stupid horror movie. Yeah, I can't remember what it was. I I, don't, I didn't watch Just it. Just an arm going around attacking people. Yeah, it was a hand or something. I don't know what it was. Peter Sellers is the name yeah, you're looking for. That's right, Peter Sellers. That's um, it. But that, that is a very um, you know popular movie. I guess it, it plays on television about. I see it about once or twice a year. I can't remember the name of it. Okay, buddy is wondering if you are on to the four B yet. Oh yes, I've been, I started using the five B pencil. Five B, okay. Um, up in here, and I've been using it a lot. Actually, been using it a lot. Now I'm switching back to a two B, um, just to put some. Just to put some little faint marks through my light zone up here. 2B or not 2B? Just, it's just a pattern. Just a texture of vertical lines in there. 2B vertical lines. There we go. 2B vertical lines or not 2B vertical Okay. Lines. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to, for a while, um, the electric eraser. <clears throat> and we're going to, I'm going to work with it for a while, pull out some really distinct marks that are that need to be darker than the lighter iris leaves that you see around here but there's a lot of dark ones in there so i'm going to pull some of those marks out less than what we can see in the you know in the reference and then i'm going to bring them back down with the stump and then go back in and pull a second set out so a couple of different steps with the uh electric eraser and the stump coming up I'm trying to keep my paper clean as i go as clean as i can All right, here we go. How many of you feel like you're in the dentist chair right now? Do you think that uh, picks up pretty well? I don't well? know. Can you hear I that? can hear it. I can hear it clearly over here. Yeah, definitely. I'm not really sure if you could. You, what we're talking about, if you, <laughs> surely you heard that. <laughs> what we're talking about is the sound the electric eraser is making. It sounds like uh, the drill your dentist would use 
in the dentist office. Right. And it, um, you have to be careful not to go through your paper. Uh, <laughs> this is pretty thick paper. It says it's Winsor Newton's 70 pound paper, but I'll be honest, it feels better thicker than the 80 pound paper that I order for my students to use, which has got me wondering about the brand that I've been using. So um, this is pretty decent paper. Now, are you ordering that paper from Blick? Yes. I think so. Not central office. I'm pretty sure it came from Blick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's good paper, but I think this is superior. Now, the kneaded eraser wants to run on you. You know, it's spinning, and it wants to kind of go in its own direction. So sometimes I feel like I need two hands um, to make a controlled mark. Especially when you're doing something delicate that has curves in right, it. Right, because I've got, I mean, this is some thick graphite I'm cut, trying to cut through. So I have to hit some of these same, uh, these same marks multiple times. Now, we should point out here that if you try to do this with a, a regular eraser, even in a Tombow mono eraser, which is a very small vinyl or plastic eraser, mm -hmm. it, you're not going to get the same results. This what, not not the same without having to go in and reshape your marks, which right. you can do, and I've I've done that for years and years. Here, just trying to make the tips more pointy now. So, and so you still might need to do some reshaping. That uh, electric pencil sharpener or, or pencil eraser though is fantastic, and I would recommend it. Yeah, it's pretty special for everyone, and inexpensive too. Seven bucks, yeah, something, something like, like that. that. Seven yep. to maybe seven to ten dollars. Well worth its weight in gold. In fact, if it was gold, it would be very extremely valuable. It's gold to me. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna need to pull out a little bit more. So that's what the filament looks like. So just slip that back into the plastic holder, and then the collar will kind of clamp down on that. Just push it in with some pressure. Now, Jesse asked, which brand is your electric eraser? But what's funny is Ashley and I both have electric erasers that look exactly the same they function exactly the same they're the same same shape all the parts are the same but they're different brands written on the side right so the really there's price. a manufacturer that's selling to lots of different uh i guess carriers yeah these re are white labeled relabeling things, but so. i got mine from hobby lobby yep yeah you can pick it up at it any big box store curate color on it color with a u Ooh, color with a U. That must be you British. You get marked off for that here in the States. Oh. Or at least you do if uh, you, if you're me. Yeah, that uh, would be a misspelling, wouldn't it? Yeah. You right. get that wrong on a That's spelling That's how my test. teachers felt about, felt about it. But if you were in Great Britain. That's what they would say. They said, this is America. And, uh, and marked me down for misspelling. I said, I'm not going to schedule a class with you anymore. <laughs> You know, there's lots of people that say schedule. I do. It drives my wife crazy. You do it? I, do you do it on purpose? Yeah, I say schedule. But there is a C in there. That's true. So the C is silent in the way that you say it. <laughs> it's when I say it. I think it's. <laughs> it's fun. a silent C. Yeah, I picked okay, it up from everyone. one of my old bosses. Now these marks are a little too bright. We're going to tone them down and put some more across them. These are supposed to be some of the. Um, sort of the medium dark value marks. Well, I really put some graphite down in a few of these areas. I might, I might uh, need a battery change. Okay, Estelle is telling us that the spelling of color is actually Australian. Okay, I like that. If you say so, mate. <laughs> Okay, someone is saying that uh, DJ28 is saying, I spell it like that, and they're in Nova Scotia. So With a U. I, probably cool. we Americans are the only ones misspelling it. Well, I, I know we misspell stuff because there's a town in our state that we misspelled for about 100 years, Asheville. We took the E out for a long time and have since put the E back in because some old documents were found that showed that it had an E in it. So hmm. that entire town misspelled its name for a little while. At least that's what I read. Correct me if I'm wrong out there. It's an, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a letter that really doesn't seem to do anything. So easy to leave out. Okay, now we've got some, it's come, some controversy going on. Uh -oh. Pat, Pat is saying color is actually the British English spelling 
also used in Canada and Australia. So I think that that's probably, you know, with a U or without the U? With the U. This is with the U. Okay. Um, Red says, are you ignoring the full details? And yeah, oh, yeah. you can't draw all the details. Yep. You've got in- nine minutes to go. So we're going to be ignoring the full details. But we've, got, we've still got hundreds of marks to put in. Yeah. This is a, a sketch in 45 minutes. That's right. Uh, but it's still going to communicate now, the subject effectively. When these get worn down around the edges, I don't know if you can tell. I'm trying to get it. Um, here we go. There you go. It's kind of a cone shaped, and so I can't get as fine a mark out of it um, using it at an angle. But if I sand it straight up and down, I can get some really fine marks while it still has a very small point on the tip. So I'm going to try to get a few of the small, light marks at the top of this shrub or bush. I guess it's more irises. Just notice how they change direction. DJ28 points out that flavor and color, as, as we've discussed, and neighbor are, are all spelled with the U. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Ian says that it's what makes Americans so charming. Is our are Americans charming? Are we charming? Oh, I love. I hope so. <laughs> oh gosh, I hope so. Um, let's see. Do you give any thought to framing when beginning a drawing? I find it frustrating if I create something I love, but it isn't a standard size. What do you do about? I, I, I almost always work with standard sizes. Not necessarily in getting sketchy. I work with standard ratios. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I paint for myself physical paintings, not digital. Um, I almost always choose standard sizes because of the framing issue. Um, haven't always done that, and I've had to pay a lot more money for custom-made frames. Um, I do too most of the time, but you can order um, frames that are disassembled, and you can assemble them. So you could you can order the tops and the bottom, for example, and the sides. And uh, then get glass cut to be the right size. And you can get that glass cut pretty much anywhere. You don't have to buy the fancy glass that they have in the frame shop, but you can. And then you can mat it yourself. Um, They used to sell those individual frames or those uh, frame edges, I guess, is a better description. Oh, yeah, that you just kind of attach together. Right, in the art store, but they've stopped doing that. So Because they also do framing, I guess. Right, and that's what I used to always do, is I I didn't care what size it was because I could always frame it by getting getting my my frame edges myself you but you can order them now uh very easily on the internet so and then you have a a bigger variety of different types of frame edges to order too so it is more convenient to just run into the store and pick up a frame when you're ready but um you can also order it too wait a couple days all right i went ahead and darkened these trees over here a little bit more than the ones towards the middle just to kind of create a little bit of uh of a change maybe hint at some atmospheric perspective um i'm going to go ahead and darken all these marks now with my stump curtis collins says i'm lucky my my wife will make the frames for me that's pretty good Ooh, what a that is great have in-house frame an excellent skill i don't even have to leave the house yeah all right so now these marks become um some of those uh, iris iris blades that actually aren't the ones that stand out so much and i'll go through and i'll put them all back in slightly different places and so they'll be hopefully um a couple layers deep of iris leaves that you can see um in 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 these two patches right here all right and we have about five minutes to do so Some of these I might tone down again with the stump. I, do, I am looking at specific iris leaves, I'm not necessarily putting them in in the same density or in the same place exactly, but I am borrowing the shapes of the leaves from the reference. So again, it's a it's a simplification. There's a less going to be less leaves, less details, um, but it's, but we can still hopefully achieve a feeling of. Uh, sort of nature and complexity by the variety of marks that we put in. K 
Okay, um, DJ28 says this is looking great. It, it absolutely is. Um, Red says, please teach us how to draw foggy areas. Do you have any advice for Red real quick on drawing fogginess or well I, I would say it's a lot of a lot of stump work yeah. stump and needed eraser use tools that give you soft marks and these will do that i i often do blurry backgrounds with these two tools just using the stump pretty dirty um now if you will uh do a search on if you're a member there's a, a live lesson series that i did where i drew an elephant walking through a misty forest and uh, there was a lot of fogginess in there. But I did a time lapse of that whole series too, and it's published on YouTube. So you'll have to go to the channel and uh, try to find that, but it's an elephant. And I've drawn a few elephants on, on the channel, uh, but uh, it's got a little bit of a foggy area. And you kind of see how I did that using a combination of pressure and the blending stump and also the eraser, kind of like Ashley alluded to there, but you can see that happen there and that might help you read. And Julie asked, where can you order those frame pieces? Uh, if you just g Google uh, framing, Frame edges, maybe. Yeah, you'll probably be able to find something. I can't think of a specific company off uh, the top of my head here. I would do the same thing that you would probably do and just go and do a quick search. Uh, but surely they still make those pieces. I'm sure they're used in frame shops. Uh, but they used to sell them in frame shops, and they don't do that anymore. Or at least they don't do here that locally here. Jan says, this is an amazing drawing. It's so rare to see graphite landscape, but this is fantastic. Yeah, I'm always nervous about landscapes personally. So this has been a this was a, a nerve wracking, I guess, selection and experience for me. Um, but because there's just such an opportunity for a variety of marks, I think that helped me. Yeah, and pulling out those light marks is making such a world of difference. Oh yeah, here. that's that really um, pushes all of that stuff in the background and makes it feel hopefully a little less important since it's a lot looser back there. Let's see, I've got two minutes, so I'm going to need to get to this side, but I just want to make sure I've got enough marks over here on the right. The marks generally get longer and maybe a little wider as we work our way down the picture plane because we're getting closer. Of course, you can see that is evident in the actual um, artwork, or I'm sorry, the reference. Just looking for spaces that feel like they need something. Again, like Matt says, sometimes we, um, sometimes we leave the reference behind a little bit. And now we're starting to get uh, some some questions rolling in here all at once. Um, first, Alana says the blank area in the middle is suddenly looking like water. So cool, absolutely. Good. Uh, Ramona asked, "Do you ever use an artist's glove?" Um, I only put a glove on when I draw on my iPad. <laughs> and and I don't get messy. It just helps my hand slide around and not stick to the glass. Yeah, and I don't. And use it's a glove. not actually a glove; it's a sock with a hole cut out. For, Are you kidding? For these three fingers, and then sometimes you turn it and, and look these, at yourself and right, talk to yourself. These two fingers stay inside the sock. It's ridiculous, <laughs> and you can order them off of Amazon probably pretty oh, cheap. Oh, I know what you're talking about. I've I've seen those I just go cut a sock up. <laughs> um, I watched MacGyver growing up. You know, I like to make my own tools. So I don't use an artist glove, Ramona, but when I draw with a material like this i usually keep a piece of paper underneath my hand shane asked how often do you draw from imagination every day pretty much every day and also draw from observation just about every day um let's see and julie says while wow, the graphite powder really makes a great foundation for the other marks it sure Absolutely. does sure does it's great for that Rose says, this picture is mind-boggling. It boggles the mind. You have boggled someone's brain. Well, I, I see there's only 36 seconds left. <laughs> I may go a minute or so over. Well, the composition is really strong in this piece, too. I don't know if if we talked about that at the beginning or not, but that the I water... I talked a little bit about um, approximate symmetry, but that was pretty much it. There, There's, uh, you know, without being too punny, there, there's <laughs> quite a good flow in this piece. Uh, the water pulls you back uh, to that bush or slash tree on the left side, and then that those the triangular positioning of those trees on the right kind of uh, kind of pull you out. So there's somewhat of an S 
through the middle of the composition. That always creates a good eye flow through the piece. Oh gosh, the time's up. And I'm not ready. All right, Shane's got a follow-up question from you. What are your favorite subjects to draw from imagination? And by the way, favorite is spelled with a U in this case. <laughs> um, I like to draw people from imagination, kind of like cartoonish and comic book style a lot. Um, and I like to make up and use linear perspective for my imagination quite a bit. Because that's, you know, it's ideal for that. It helps us draw things that uh, we can't always observe or see. All right, now I got all these disc these marks in here. They're not, they're, they're okay. Um, but I want to put, and this is, I guess, what we ran out of time for. I just want to put a dark edge on a few of them just to help with the feeling um, of overlapping. Just so it feels like some are in front of others and they're not all on the same level. Jan gives you the ultimate compliment. The drawing is better than the photo. Oh, that is the ultimate compliment. I thank you for saying so. <laughs> Hootenholler says, thanks for another great lesson in visual arts and language arts. <laughs> <laughs> of course. This is definitely not a lesson in language arts. No. It's a, <laughs> it's a struggle in language arts. So. Do not believe what we say about language arts, biology, <laughs> definitely not history, biology. Um, Let's see, chemistry, <laughs> um, all of the other subjects we seem to to cover here. The only one that matters is art. That's you can right. trust us on art. All the other things um, are purely for entertainment purposes. All right. Well, I guess I've got to I've got to stop. I could think I could go for a couple of more sessions on this one, but uh, oh my gosh. I think it looks great. It's a great sketch. Can't stop. And it's got good contrast. There I we think go. a, a just few needed folks a are, few more down there. I just needed a few more. A few folks are are wishing that some of the values could be a little bit darker in areas, but I think the value in the in the actual image, I'm mm -hmm. willing to guess that they're darker than what they appear on the screen. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes that happens. Because Ashley's using well, a 5B pencil. I want I mean the main thing for me is that uh, the values are arranged correctly. You know, like the the darkest thing is still the darkest thing. And mm -hmm. Speaking of which, I'll make it a little bit darker. But uh, the, and, and then whatever, you know, the next value up, even if it's a little lighter or a little darker, it still fits between the two values on either side of it right. in terms of its place and position in the composition. So that's what I'm looking for more so. But, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a sketch. Um, in 45 minutes, and uh, there's definitely definitely uh, more that could be done. All right, real quick, because you're going to have to spin the wheel for me. That's right. For next week. we got to move on. Kizzy Cat says, what are it. some good subjects for someone beginning drawing? Oh and I would say anything that you see laying around, Kizzy. Yes. You draw from observation as much as you can to really study the objects, anything. It really doesn't matter what it is. I like Just to draw. Look, I like to draw, draw not nature. You know, I like to work with harder edge subjects when yep. I, at, at the beginning, at the start, where you can see the geometry in there. You know, I'm looking at a speaker in front of me, and it's close to a rectangular prism, but it's got some rounded edges, those kind of things. Now, did you know what one tree said to another tree? I don't know what. Geometry. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. The comments are coming really fast there. It looks fantastic. I feel inspired. Ashley, that looks fantastic. I enjoyed your conversation while making it a piece of art. Thanks for that, Red. I love this. Um, uh, let's see uh, here. I would start bit. with the very simple forms and things you see around you. Uh, Buddy is giving Kizzy Cat that suggestion. Uh, the more you draw from observation, no matter what it is, the better you will get. And when you can't, when you can't draw, when you don't have a piece of paper or pencil in front of you, then work your mind. Imagine yourself drawing those subjects. Think about how you would draw it. Look at spatial relationships between different shapes. Oh yeah, you can on the do subjects. that. And Just you, while you're talking to somebody, you can right. look at the proportions of their face. Yes. And you can just uh, practice that way because drawing is something that happens between your ears. I, I know we're all, all obsessed with making marks and, and things like that, but it is really a, an activity that happens in your brain that just materializes on the surface. So practice in your brain any chance that you get. All right. Fantastic job. I love the border you added around there. It looks really good. Just starting to separate it from the smudgy paper. All right. I'm going to ha hide the reference image and the timer here okay 
Because it's spin uh, the wheel time. It's time to spin the wheel. Now, if you've missed this, what we're doing with this season of Getting Sketchy, this is the eighth season of Getting Sketchy here. The first few seasons, it was just me. Um, and uh, it, in season eight here, we each, each season we have a motif or a theme. And in the past, I've had a theme and Ashley's had a different theme and we've just switched back and forth. But this, the theme for this season are the wheels. And we have two wheels and one wheel has the mediums and the other wheel has the subject matter. So there whatever Ashley rolls for medium and subject matter is what I will have to do next week for getting sketchy. Um, and please don't give me people with colored pencils. <laughs> <laughs> please Ooh. don't give me that oh, one. Oh, gosh. You watch. That's what's going to happen here. <laughs> well, I hope so. I hope you um, so it. Ashley, right, I've got it set up so we can see both of the little red well, markers. Well, let's roll one at a time. Okay. So we'll start with the medium. We'll make it as dramatic as possible. That's right. I really should have um, some music playing here, mm -hmm. some d dramatic some music. Maybe I'll have that music. next week. Okay, here we go. Um, I hope I get here a we good go. The spin. medium will be yeah. next week. Oh, this is so it's dramatic. A good spin. It's a what good spin. kind of tension is this? Cents. No. Pastels. pastels. All right, I'll All right. take that. Right. You like now pastel. that could be could that could be pastel. soft pastels, pastel pencils, or oil pastels. Oh, okay. okay. So just pastels Anything with the general word pastel. Layer. All title. right, and the subject matter All will right. be hmm. Vehicles would be tough in pastel. Ooh, right, here would. we go. Here we go. It would. We we'll do a boat. <laughs> That's right. It's any vehicle, not just cars. Uh, watch it be vehicles. A landscape. Another landscape. A pastel, in pastel. landscape okay. next week. Okay. Is what. I will be doing. I feel like that's inside so. of your wheelhouse. A that is bit. inside of my wheelhouse. Yep. Pastel I am, landscapes. I am happy to do pastel landscapes <laughs> next week, um, as evidenced by my big old smile on my face that I escaped, <laughs> escaped doing people with colored pencils, which would be really hard. But uh, it's coming. Not not necessarily difficult, just really time consuming. Yeah. And in forty five minutes, it's not a lot of time. You'd have mm -hmm. to do like a, a body part, like an eye or nose yeah. or mouth or something. A thumbs like that. up. Yeah, thumbs up. A finger. <laughs> well, Ashley, I think you did a great job tonight. Um, do you have any closing words for the people out there? Um, I would just encourage you to try a variety of materials with your graphite. Uh, something I didn't use tonight was a um, an eraser shield. Um, maybe we'll have a chance to use that in, uh, in another lesson. But um, there's more than just the pencil and the rubber eraser. So the kneaded eraser is very valuable. The stumps are very valuable. And even that electric eraser. So if you like to draw in graphite, um, explore graphite materials. Even the water-soluble graphite you know, that Matt um, has in the studio, um, give that a shot and see. I've had students use that to great effect in their backgrounds, keeping them much softer um, than their foreground, which they worked up with regular graphite pencil. So try some other materials. Excellent advice. And I see your comments down there. Let's see. Uh, Jen says, Matt, you got off easy this time. <laughs> That's because I put weights on the wheel before it spun. Oh, it's fixed. Yeah, it's all fixed. It's a fixed. Um, it's like, it's like Atlantic it's City really over fixed, here. Because somebody will really think that I did. I, I didn't. <laughs> um, and Ian says, you got a hanging curveball there. Uh, yeah, maybe so. But I'll take it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a long season. It'll be my second drawing this season. And, you know, pastels are one of my favorite mediums to use, if not the favorite. And now, we could consider... Landscapes are great. We, we, we'll have two landscapes in the books. You know, yeah. we could consider... Oh, we could do that. Once you have two of a subject remove that subject and put something else in that would require me making a new will or oh yeah I, you know what i got an idea what i'll do is i'll just put a big x on it <laughs> okay well that's we'll, good we'll figure it out just but, to yeah. make sure we don't end up with a, a whole season of just two subjects right just yes. landscapes the whole season yeah. we're gonna do pastel landscapes the entire season no, we're not gonna do that <laughs> um so we'll retire landscapes after next week that's a good uh, idea uh because i think we got enough room on that wheel there that means somebody will have to do somebody will have to do vehicles well, that's the it idea. It'd be great happen. if we have everything represented. I mean, everything right. could be represented, or at least be. maybe it five out of the six choices on each right. wheel. That's what we're going for. And a for. unicycle and a skateboard, those are vehicles, Those right? count, right. Anything yeah. anything that uh, with motion. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to head over to thevirtualinstructor.com. We're not physically moving anywhere, but uh, the live lesson will follow this. And Ashley is working on a, uh, a gouache landscape, or a landscape, a gouache <laughs> still life of art materials. 
So um, I get to kick back and man the, the chat box again, and I'm excited to do that. And I'm going to wash my hands. <laughs> yeah, he's going to have to wash his hands before he starts making marks on that surface. I don't want to get a graphite to mix in with the gouache. No. Uh, guys, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. This is a lot of fun. And uh, remember, drawing is a skill that anyone can learn and develop. It doesn't matter where you are in life. It is a skill that you can learn and develop. It just takes knowledge and practice. Uh, thanks again for joining us. Make sure you like the video, subscribe, and all that stuff. With that, I'm going to go ahead and sign out for this evening. Uh, good night, everybody. All right.